Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I enjoyed the, the, your talk that, uh, this morning. It was uh, inspiring, and uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I've been here at uh, Howard University in the past, and I gave uh, lectures to the students and Grand Rounds, and uh, it's always a pleasure to come back and see many of you that I've known for years. And um, uh, the topic we are going to talk about today is acute coronary syndrome. It's probably the next step from heart failure and muscle uh, uh, distress. Um, it's uh, not the type, however, that uh, leads to dilated cardiomyopathies, ischemic uh, uh, heart disease that uh, leads to heart failure, is, a, is the other half of the patients who present with heart failure. But nevertheless, um, it is a very, um, still very interesting and very hot topic. It's a topic that uh, keeps busy um, many of the cardiologists uh, in the city and around the country and around the world. Coronary disease is still um, uh, the uh, most common cause of uh, morbidity and mortality in developed countries and in developing countries as well. Uh, there are lots of developments and lots of uh, uh, changes that are taking place almost, almost daily in uh, the uh, diagnosis and management of acute coronary syndromes, and the guidelines are constantly changing. And uh, I'm going to try to, in the next 30 minutes or so, to give you a, a summary of uh, where we are, uh, what kind of changes have we implemented uh, uh, in the last uh, two decades uh, to better treat these patients, and uh, how much have we achieved by uh, implementing new methods and new techniques of uh, treating patients with uh, coronary disease that pre present with acute coronary syndromes. Um, needless to say that uh, the ACS is the most uh, uh, common uh, problem that brings patients to the hospitals. There were 1.6 million uh, uh, people that presented with acute coronary syndromes in uh, 2009, and uh, about uh, a million of those 973,000 that presented with uh, ST elevation MI, uh, and the rest were presented with unstable angina. Uh, the uh, MI uh, is, uh, is the syndrome that's associated with uh, increased uh, cardiac enzymes and is uh, separated to ST elevation and uh, non-ST elevation. Um, about uh, two-thirds of the patients present with a uh, non-ST elevation and about one-third with um, uh, STEMI. The pathophysiology of the acute coronary syndrome is interesting. Um, most of these events uh, appear and present in patients who have substrate of uh, atherosclerotic heart disease. It's rare that uh, 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 we see patients uh, presenting with acute coronary syndrome that had totally clean coronaries, although it is possible. Uh, these are patients that usually use uh, illicit drugs, a cocaine is a, a frequent uh, cause of that, or develop vasospasm and it, uh, develop uh, ischemic syndromes uh, without coronary disease. So, um, in patients who have even uh, uh, non-flow uh, limiting uh, atherosclerotic lesions, uh, for some reason there is a disruption of the plaque uh, and, and plaque rupture that uh, starts the, and triggers the, um, the uh, development of a thrombus that will, uh, will eventually either totally or subtotally the flow of, uh, of uh, blood through the artery and that will uh, initiate the acute coronary syndrome. I just want to make this point to make it uh, as clear as I can that uh, STEMI and non-STEMI have pretty much the same uh, pathophysiology and the same uh, uh, <coughs> triggers and the same uh, 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 disruption of the plaques. The difference is, uh, is the extent to which the plaque ruptures. If there's a deep fissure and a deep rupture, that will uh, lead to um, a complete occlusion down here of the artery, a total de deprivation of blood flow, and that will uh, cause ST elevation in my. If there is a subtotal occlusion and uh, uh, even a small amount of blood is, is going downstream, that will lead to uh, a non-STEMI, non-ST elevation. And uh, that's uh, supposed to be a more benign syndrome and allow us more time to uh, work. Um, 
the uh, plaque rupture uh, starts early, in, uh, the plaque uh, formation starts early in life and the cholesterol obviously is a very important factor that leads to plaque, plaque formation, but a lot of other risk factors that we know of, uh, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, um, uh, sedentary lifestyle contribute to the formation of, uh, of plaques. And uh, these plaques may be stable for years and may not be causing any symptoms. And uh, we know that these uh, are present in a lot of people that go through life and they never, never have problems. So what uh, triggers the, de the development of plaque rupture and acute coronary syndrome is interesting. And a lot of research has been done and demonstrated that uh, uh, the development of uh, inflammation in the, uh, in the area of the plaque uh, the thin cap and the uh, lipid core are very important components of the plaque that make it vulnerable and in the presence of uh, triggers, uh, plaque rupture may occur. And those triggers have been uh, identified through uh, extensive and very laborious uh, research. Um, and among those is acute elevations of blood pressure and that's how uh, blood pressure can lead to um, uh, plaque rupture and contributes to the development of acute demise. Uh, here is a, a, a rupture of the plaque and the development of a clot uh, that occludes the artery, and this patient presented, uh, presents with acute MI. Cholesterol is a very uh, important component of the plaque, and the more cholesterol there is in the plaque, the more likely it is to rupture. When there is a lot of uh, uh, cholesterol, the, uh, the core of the plaque is thin and vulnerable, but the presence of cholesterol crystals also can trigger rupture, and this is a very nice uh, uh, slide that's been uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine almost 10 years ago and shows the poking of cholesterol crystal through the, uh, uh, the uh, plaque into the lumen. And uh, you see that here it's enlarged. And when this happens, it leads to uh, accumulation of platelets. And these platelets uh, will attract a, a fibrin and, and develop a clot and include the artery. So a, a vulnerable plaque is a plaque that uh, has a large lipid core, a, a thin uh, cap, and a lot of inflammatory components, including uh, macrophages and T lymphocytes. And uh, 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 in, uh, in the presence of triggers, it's more likely to rupture than a more stable plaque, although the, the two plaques may be uh, causing the same uh, uh, decrease in the lumen of the artery. So it's not just the presence of a plaque or atherosclerotic disease that uh, um, is uh, uh, leading or predisposing to acute coronary syndromes. It's also the vulnerability of the plaques and uh, the likelihood of uh, the plaques rupturing or of attracting uh, in any way platelets to accumulate and develop a, a platelet clot. The platelet clot will uh, eventually attract fibrin um, uh, red cells and uh, develop a clot. If it's a total occlusive clot, we'll call it cause a STEMI. If it's a subtotal, we'll cause um, a non-STEMI and or unstable angina. Now, um, in the last uh, two or three decades, uh, a great effort has been put forward to treat uh, high cholesterol, to treat hypertension, and we have great success. The control rates of hypertension went from 25% all the way to 85% in our hospital due to uh, the efforts of Dr. Singh and Dr. Fletcher and myself, uh, the control rates have gone up to 85, 90%, the best in the country. Uh, the control of cholesterol also went from, uh, you know, about one third of the patients treated uh, and uh, reaching their targets went all the way up to 70 or 80%. And this has uh, an impact and we see that uh, since uh, the early 2000s, the uh, incidence of uh, acute MI uh, has been uh, declining steadily and is still de uh, declining all the way uh, as of today. Mostly we see a decrease in the incidence of uh, ST elevation MI, although non stemis that are less severe uh, have been uh, remaining steady or uh, have shown some increase. This is an indication that they, uh, uh, we still get uh, a fair number of heart attacks, but these heart attacks are milder, and these heart attacks uh, cause less myocardial damage, and this is due to the intensive treatment of uh, the cardiovascular risk factors. And uh, Steve Singh will tell you that uh, the uh, patients that present with uh, malignant arrhythmias these days, VTVF, and a sudden death has also gone down. I remember 
before we started these efforts in the mid 80s, we had a, a, a whole slew of patients admitted with sustained VT that we couldn't control because they have suffered uh, large MIs and that we couldn't uh, really uh, uh, get any antiarrhythmics to control them. We'd take them in the lab to ablate their arrhythmias and keep them in there trying all these antiarrhythmics that Steve Singer got approved by the FDA and uh, we couldn't find any, any effective therapies. We don't see these patients anymore. The reason is because they get smaller MIs and we get, get to them early, we open their arteries and they don't get uh, too much uh, of myocardial damage and that leads to a better prognosis and improvement in survival and improvement uh, of the outcomes that we see in these patients. So the risk factor modifications and the aggressive treatment of the risk factors is responsible for the treat, uh, decline of uh, acute myocardial infarctions and uh, uh, decline in the more severe ST elevation MIs that we see. So let's talk a little bit about STEMI and uh, what kind of uh, changes we have seen in uh, uh, the last uh, several years in the diagnosis and management of these patients. First, we know that the patient who has uh, a STEMI, ST elevation, is, uh, is a patient that needs immediate care, and the faster we get to them, the better it is. Uh, and the algorithms uh, uh, and the guidelines have been developed to uh, uh, encourage and actually make all of us to identify and treat this patient as fast as possible. And there are guidelines that have been circulating for a number of years now by the American Heart Association, uh, encouraging uh, uh, education of the patients to tell them about uh, their heart attacks, the possibility of, of having sudden death, and then what they sh should be doing in case they get symptoms of chest pain. They need to uh, uh, be trained and educated to call 911 within five minutes of developing symptoms if they have nitroglycerin, and take one, uh, and uh, uh, seek help as soon as possible. Uh, they should be transferred to uh, a, a hospital um, with, uh, by the ambulance or that are, the drivers now are trained and they will do that to a, a hospital that will uh, be uh, capable of uh, performing a primary PCI to open their arteries and salvage the myocardium. The timelines that we're used to is that the patient should call within five minutes, the transportation should not take more than 30 minutes, and uh, if he's going to get thrombolytics, that should be given within 30 minutes, and if we're going to open his artery, it should be uh, open within 90 minutes. That means that the patient is taken into a place where these uh, uh, practices are routine and they can be done and they can uh, uh, help this patient. And the reason we want to take these patients uh, in a hospital that can open their arteries by any means um, as fast as possible is because the longer we wait, the more myocytes we lose, the more myocardial we use, lose, and uh, the more uh, uh, increase, uh, we increase the risk of developing uh, um, uh, myocardial damage permanently, and uh, uh, that leads to heart failure and premature death. Now, how should we uh, aim in opening the artery? It's been a, a matter of debate for you know, a long time, more than uh, two decades, and more than four decades. Uh, the first time that we tried to open an artery that uh, causing a, a ST elevation MI, it was, um, well, um, in the 60s, uh, it was found that there is clot there, and if you uh, give the uh, thrombolytics or uh, uh, sort of kinase, then uh, it opened. But it became a practice in the early 80s when Kennedy started giving uh, intracoronary streptokinase to, to dissolve the clots, and we found that it works and actually can salvage myocardium. And then we started all these trials with thrombolytics, and we found that they do work but they did have a lot of complications, and some of them were very severe, and some of them were very uh, uh, catastrophic, like uh, uh, and, and the cranial hemorrhage that was most of the times fatal. This wasn't uh, very common, it was about one to two percent of the patients, but still it's very uh, damaging uh, to the procedure, and we started uh, looking for other ways to open the arteries, and we came up, as Interventionalists came up with the idea of putting a balloon in there and opening the artery. And uh, studies were done comparing the thrombolytics with the uh, with the uh, balloon uh, dilatation and later uh, putting stents in the occluded arteries. And we found that actually doing primary PCI was better, preventing uh, more deaths. The yellow is thrombolytics. The 
orange is uh, b balloon dilatation or uh, PCI, and it, uh, PCI is better in preventing deaths, uh, deaths without shock, uh, uh, recurrent myocardial infarction, uh, recurrent ischemia, and it was associated with fewer strokes, uh, no hemorrhagic strokes, and uh, overall the composite endpoints are a lot less uh, with primary PCI than we uh, thrombolytics, and that's why we're kind of abandoning thrombolytics now whenever we can, and we're going with primary PCI, and you see all these uh, centers now that are developing programs with, uh, with, uh, for primary PCI, and every one of us who does uh, procedures is on call 24-7 every other week, um, and, uh, and uh, we go in to uh, salvage patients doing the primary PCI instead of giving thrombolytics. We also found out through the years that uh, um, the longer we wait to go in, uh, the more damage occurs, and actually uh, we do have uh, uh, increased mortality. Mortality can be uh, down to 4% if we get to the patients within uh, uh, the 90 minutes. It can go up to 12% if we wait, uh, wait three, four hours. So uh, yes, we can have an impact on mortality. We get to the patients early, and that's why we're trying to do uh, the uh, opening of the artery within uh, uh, 90 minutes from the onset of symptoms or from the first uh, medical contact. Uh, what this slide is showing is that uh, uh, patients who develop ST elevation MI uh, uh, can be brought to the emergency room to the hospital that is capable of opening their arteries by helicopters, by ambulance, by car, by relatives. Uh, and it's important to make the right diagnosis quickly and call, call in the team for uh, recanalization of the artery. In any case, a, a, a number of questions have been asked through the years, uh, what is the best way to uh, treat these patients? Uh, yes, uh, uh, patients who present, uh, uh, who have an acute MI in the neighborhood, uh, they can call 911 and they can, uh, can come easily to the closest hospital. But how about patients that are um, up in Hagerstown or they are up in the Bunis and they, uh, they don't have access to uh, a close by hospital that is uh, PCI capable. In those patients, the recommendations have, uh, um, have uh, uh, changed and they allow now to give thrombolytics and then transfer them to the hospital for uh, PCI if it's needed uh, and uh, can, can be um, uh, evaluation at the, when they arrive at the hospital and they can be uh, treated with balloons and stents only if they did not recanalize with thrombolytics. Uh, there were studies that uh, led to this uh, recommendation, and uh, most of these studies were done in Scandinavia. And uh, what my uh, monitor shows here is the Nordic STEMI study uh, that uh, included patients uh, that were diagnosed in remote areas and they, with the ST elevation MI, and they were randomized to immediate transfer for uh, PCI and angiography or uh, uh, conservative ischemic uh, uh, guided treatment after thrombolytic therapy. And it shows that if you do uh, a routine uh, a catheterization early on as fast as you can uh, and then open the artery uh, when it's needed, if, if they didn't uh, open with, uh, with uh, uh, thrombolytics, it was better. It led to decrease in uh, complications and better survival. A larger study that was done here in the United States, uh, uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, showed that routine early angiography after fibrinolysis for acute myocardial infarction um, it was better and uh, improved outcomes uh, in patients with ST elevation MI. It was published in 2009 in the New England Journal of Medicine and had about uh, um, uh, 1,000 patients randomized uh, to these two procedures. The time after thrombolytics uh, in the, the patients that had the routine PCI was three hours. In the patients that uh, uh, were randomized to ischemic driven uh, uh, revascularization, the average time was 48 hours. So it's better to open the arteries early and it's better to uh, do it in an effective way in those who need it. Uh, since then, um, uh, seven studies that were published uh, randomized the patients to the same way after thrombolytic therapy uh, to early intervention or wait and see. And the early intervention consistently was found to be better. And that's why we, uh, these days we cut all the patients who had uh, uh, ST elevation and they got thrombolytics. And similarly, we have all the patients that had um, 
Yeah, um, non ST elevation MI uh, for, for the same reason to open arteries that are occluded. The guidelines that were published in 2013 uh, recommend that uh, the following algorithm, and I'm sorry you cannot see it, but the patient who presents with ST elevation MI uh, should initially be seen, uh, uh, sent to a, 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 a PCI capable hospital to perform primary PCI to open the artery within 90 minutes or uh, from uh, first medical contact or door to balloon time when they present to the emergency room uh, uh, within 90 minutes. This is the time frame that you salvage most of the myocardium. And there, there isn't um, too much residual if you succeed to open the artery with this, with this uh, time frame. However, uh, patients who um, uh, are first seen in a hospital that, that doesn't have a cath lab and cannot uh, perform PCI, um, once the, uh, the MI is diagnosed, uh, the patient should get out of that hospital within 30 minutes and send to another hospital where they can perform um, a PCI within, um, within uh, 90 minutes again. If this is not possible, the recommendations say that we should give the patient, this patient thrombolytics in the first hospital and then put him in an ambulance to go to a hospital that's further away. If it's raining, if it's snowing and there, and there is no ambulance, we'll, uh, we'll treat him with thrombolytics and uh, send him as soon as we can to a hospital where he can be treated. So uh, for primary PCI, patients are recommended if they have ischemic symptoms with, uh, within uh, 12 hours of the onset of symptoms. Um, if, they, uh, if they have um, symptoms, um, ischemic symptoms in less than 12 hours and have contraindications for thrombolytics, uh, this is a class one, uh, 1B uh, recommendation. If they are in cardiogenic shock, uh, thrombolytics don't work and uh, we, uh, we uh, need to take those patients uh, for primary PCI as fast as we can. Patients who have um, delayed presentation, and we see these patients frequently, unfortunately, because they don't know, they don't know better, or they have not been um, uh, trained or educated enough, you don't know who's gonna get a heart attack to go and train. So, uh, a lot of patients that, uh, you know, get the chest pains out of the blue and they present with chest pain, Chest pain, they may think it's their stomach, they may think it's a muscle, they may think it's uh, something else, and they may present to the emergency room or to uh, the, a medical facility um, after 12 hours. But if we uh, diagnose them then and uh, they still have chest pains, they still have an indication to be taken in the cath lab. Um, if it's after 12, 12 to 4 hours, it doesn't seem that it makes much of a difference and we shouldn't, uh, and if they don't have symptoms, we should uh, uh, watch the patients, stabilize them, and we can cut them up before they are uh, discharged. Now, the indications for thrombolytics um, are similar, uh, and certainly there is a, a demonstrable benefit if we give thrombolytics within the first 12 hours after the uh, presentation of ST elevation MI. The evidence is uh, softer uh, if they present uh, between 12 and 24 hours, and they are de uh, definitely hard if they don't have ST elevation in mind, but only they have ST depression. Because remember, we said earlier that patients don't have, that don't have total occlusion, they have primarily a platelet clot, and platelets don't respond to thrombolytics, it's the clot that responds and lies to thr uh, after thrombolytics. And uh, you are only left with the, uh, the adverse effects of thrombolytics because they don't affect the platelet clot. And uh, 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 the uh, thrombolysis is contraindicated in patients with ST segment depression, unless that is an indication of posterior MI, which is usually due to the occlusion of the circumflex or a small cir circumflex. Here are a couple of examples. This is a patient that we had uh, 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 last year uh, at the VA hospital, 78 year old uh, man who was admitted with chest pain and had positive cardiac enzymes. We took him to the cath, uh, cath lab when he presented his chest pain went away with nitroglycerin and the treatment. But we found that he had an, uh, an occluded circumflex artery here. He had an occluded uh, right coronary artery here. And uh, he had a lesion in the LAD, in the proximal LAD and the mid LAD. Um, called the surgeons and uh, we set up this patient for surgery the next day. Uh, it's better to wait for 24 hours so if the patient is stable 
to send him uh, uh, to surgery because uh, the outcomes are better, uh, the platelets are less, less aggressive, the patient has uh, been uh, optimized, and the outcomes of surgery are better. And if they are stable, it's a K2 way. However, uh, this patient uh, was in the CCU, and at midnight the nurse said, oh, we have to take this patient for a shower because it's going to surgery, and it's better for uh, uh, septic reasons. So they sent said, they said the patient to the uh, shower by himself. And the patient, when he started moving around, he developed a, a lot of ischemia and he collapsed. They did CPR in the bathroom. Um, in, uh, and uh, uh, they called me at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, he had tremendous ST elevation, and I'm sorry I couldn't find that, uh, that EKG. Five millimeter ST elevation in the anterior leaves, or maybe I do. Uh, this is his EKG after the cath. Um, yeah, we don't. Uh, yeah, th this is a slide that, uh, and this is his EKG, and Steve Singh will tell you that this is a tremendous ST elevation um, uh, due to ischemia of the anterior wall. And um, uh, we had no choice at that, at that point. Uh, when we saw this EKG, we took, took uh, the patient in the cath lab. We opened his cerebral, we opened his right, and uh, uh, the patient stabilized. And the next day, uh, we did open his LAD as well, and we put a stents in all three arteries. And actually, he recovered, he, he normalized, and um, uh, he, uh, he was extubated in three days, and he was stable. Unfortunately, from all that stress, he developed perforation of a peptic ulcer, and he needed surgery that was corrected surgically, and he still t stabilized. And a week later, he went home with no myocardial damage. And that's, that's the benefit you get from having a, a team on call that, that can uh, go in and salvage the myocardium and prevent permanent damage uh, and uh, uh, reduction of ejection fraction. and, and, uh, and uh, that leads to patient to heart failure. You can see his troponins here peaked uh, to 40 after he developed ST elevation, but they quickly came down, which is an indication of reperfusion. His uh, serum creatinine, because uh, of kidney disease, went up to three, but then it normalized after, after we fixed his coronaries. His blood pressure was marginal, uh, 90 to 100, uh, when we, we saw the patient. But after, after his, uh, his uh, coronaries were uh, recanalized, his pressure improved and went to the normal range uh, because his contractility came back and his cardiac output improved. Uh, so that, that's a patient that uh, you can see the, uh, the benefits from acute interventions and acute uh, revascularization. Here's another patient that presented to the emergency room uh, with chest pain that was off and on. And uh, it was 5 o'clock in the morning, the fellow calls me and says, well, he has an inferior MI because he has a ST elevation in the inferior leads. 15 minutes later, he says, no, 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 it is an anterior MI because now the ST elevation is in, the, in uh, V2 and V3. And it was going back and forth. By the time I, I got there, he had ST elevation in both the inferior leads and the anterior leads. And for a good reason, because this patient had an occluded RCA that uh, gives the inferior MI, had an occluded LAD that gives the anterior MI. Fortunately, he had a big diagonal that was keeping the lateral wall uh, viable in the circumflex, and the patient was still uh, holding him with dynamics. We opened both the, uh, the, uh, the right coronary and the LAD, and the patient again recovered and went home uh, without much of a damage. So primary PCI is recommended uh, now uh, by all the guidelines, the most current, as the preferred procedure in patients with uh, uh, present with ST elevation MI. And um, even Steve Singh knows that, that uh, PCI should not be performed in non-infarct uh, artery. But these are the old guidelines. They have changed, and now they allow uh, a, a, a recanalization of other um, arteries if uh, the patient uh, can uh, uh, comply with the regimen and uh, uh, has ischemic symptoms. Another question that's been uh, posed through the years is whether we should do a clot aspiration uh, uh, during the uh, acute MI phase, and that's been recommended routinely because in patients who have large clots, it's good to take them out. And there are some early data from a single center showed that it's beneficial, leads to uh, less embolization, less acute MI, but this data did not materialize and uh, several studies were published later with a larger number of patients, so that was not true. Actually, there was no 
benefit from early aspiration before you put a stand. So the guidelines change and they no longer recommend um, uh, aspiration. Um, also, uh, data have been uh, uh, crea created and generated at PCI of a, a non-infarct artery may be considered in selected patients with ST elevation MI and multivessel angioplasty can be done at the time when you, are, you open the artery. In the patients are dynamically stable, um, and you can do that at the same time, and, or uh, if the lesion is sort of complex and you may uh, take a long time, give you a lot of contrast, and the patient is stable, you may wait until the next day. However, in the patient, and we had uh, several patients who presented with an occluded LAD and a tight lesion in the cerf, and we opened both because the patient was still ischemic after opening the, opening the occluded artery. And the uh, recommendations also changed to, uh, uh, to not mandate from bectomy any, anymore because uh, uh, this is not uh, beneficial in most patients. A, a routine aspiration from bectomy before PCI is not useful. Um, here is another patient that presented with uh, non-ST non elevation MI, positive troponins and this uh, T wave. Uh, 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 T-wave inversion in the anterior leads. Uh, this is a patient that uh, I think is, is kind of unique because uh, he presented with chest pain, positive troponins, uh, the pain went away, and um, uh, we found that his platelet count was 30. He had splenomegaly, he some other, had some other disease uh, that was causing that, and we cut him, and he had this single lesion at the origin of the left main. And in a patient that has low platelets, uh, you're concerned if you give him a, 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 a dual antiplatelet therapy, they may bleed. Uh, he has another lesion in the diagonal here. It was Friday afternoon, discussing with the surgeon, and said, let's put the lima there so you won't need long-term antiplatelet therapy and uh, see if that uh, patient uh, does better. He was young, so we agreed. However, a uh, few hours later, uh, when, um, uh, but, I was eating dinner down, 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 uh, downtown DC. The patient did not take aspirin and Plavix, and he developed this ST elevation with uh, uh, a lot of chest pain. We were called in and put a stem there and opened the artery. The patient did well. We did put him on Plavix and aspirin, and he's doing well since then. He still has low platelets. Uh, uh, he never had spl uh, uh, splenectomy, but he's tolerating the antiplatelet therapy, and he's not. Uh, having any major bleedings. Uh, a platelet clots is uh, uh, the usual uh, cause of uh, subtotal occlusions, and that's what, uh, why dual antiplatelet therapy, aspirin, and uh, one of the ADP receptor inhibitors, uh, we went from ticlobidine to clobidogrel, and now we have prasugrel and uh, ticagrelol that seem to be better than clobidogrel in preventing MIs and uh, cardiovascular death. Uh, Tyclobidine uh, went out of, uh, of uh, preference because causing a lot of adverse effects. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, GP2B3A inhibitors that are very helpful in the acute phase. The oral 2 b 3 inhibitors uh, increase mortality and we don't use them anymore. Uh, but uh, we can uh, use uh, thrombin inhibitors these days and a lot of, a lot of other anticoagulants that may be useful. Aspirin is the basis of antiplatelet therapy. There are lots of data that have shown that. The CARE study showed that the doses uh, from 75 to 1,000 or 1,500 milligrams decrease uh, uh, mortality and cardiovascular events by 25%. But there is no much difference between uh, a low dose and intermediate or high dose, uh, whereas there is increase in bleeding complication with the higher doses. That's why we prefer the low dose of aspirin particularly in combination with, uh, with uh, uh, ADP receptor inhibitors, Plavix, uh, Ticagrel, or Prasugrel. These patients that present with a non-STEMI, uh, they do have vulnerable plaques, and they, uh, although we may fix one artery, they may, uh, they may have other plaques that may cause similar events. Uh, and we uh, made it uh, a routine practice now to cathode these patients and correct the lesions that are flow limiting, uh, causing problems, and or send the patients to surgery if they need to. So the question is not uh, no longer whether we, we should cut these patients. The question, uh, question is when and uh, how fast do we really need to take them in the cath lab within a couple of hours or can we wait? There are lots of studies that were done, and here's a, a paper in the Jungler Journal of Medicine that actually found that there is some benefit if we take them early as compared to late 
but this benefit was driven primarily by uh, less angina, something that's a soft endpoint, uh, and it was primarily uh, present in the older and higher risk patients. And actually, from this study, it was concluded that uh, uh, there is no uh, ma mandatory uh, pressure to take these patients early. If the patient is stable and it comes in on uh, a Saturday morning, you can wait until Monday to cut them if the other patient is stable. However, if they do have ischemia, uh, then we need to proceed faster. Antiplatelet therapy and aspirin is mandatory. And here's the, uh, the, here's the algorithm of how to proceed with these patients. Um, uh, we stabilize them uh, and they can be uh, 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 treated uh, based on whether they have recurrent ischemia or not. Aspirin is mandatory. Uh, uh, Tabidogrel and ticagrel uh, are the preferred agents. Prasugrel can be associated with increased bleeding in certain groups of patients. It's not part of the uh, most recent gu guidelines. Um, Anticoagulation is very helpful. and fractionated heparin and oxaparin and fotaparinax. And um, early invasive strategy follows the same algorithm for treatment. And uh, this has worked well and has uh, uh, benefited uh, the majority of the patients with um, uh, um, uh, non-ST elevation in my uh, and unstable angina. So uh, the recommendations uh, say pretty much the same thing, that uh, uh, urgent invasive strategy uh, is indicated <coughs> in patients uh, with uh, non-STEMI uh, who uh, have refractory angina, they are not controlled medically. Uh, however, it's not mandatory for those who can stabilize and um, uh, they, have, they are low risk. It is uh, reasonable to choose an early invasive strategy over a delayed invasive strategy for uh, initial stabilization, uh, uh, the, for initially stabilized high-risk patients with uh, uh, no STEMI. Uh, for those not at high risk, intermediate risk, or delayed invasive approach is, uh, is reasonable. Um, a strategy of multivessel PCI in contrast to the culprit lesion, only a PCI may be reasonable for patients with non-STEMI. And uh, these guidelines are consistent with the practice we had for the last 10 years. So um, overall, how should we approach in general terms the patients with ACS? They, uh, that includes all unstable angina, STEMI, and non-STEMI. Uh, basically, uh, uh, the STEMI patients should all be uh, uh, taken for primary PCI if, if possible, or thrombolysis if, if, if it's not possible uh, for recanalization. The uh, non-STEMI patients can be uh, um, uh, uh, worked up and uh, categorized in high risk and low risk, and the low risk patients are okay, they are treated medically, particularly if they have a lot of comorbidities, but most of the patients should be taken to a cath lab to open the, uh, the culprit artery and not do um, a multivessel PCI if they have a lot of blockage in other arteries. Some of these patients may go for cabbage, and some may not be amenable to either one, and they can be treated medically. Well, that's all I had to say, and uh, sorry I took longer, but thank you very much.